Welcome um, to this peer-to-peer -peer idea exchange. Um, today we are talking about recovery capital. Um, my name is Shirsten Freskin. I'm a senior program associate with um, the Center for Children and Family Futures. And we are so pleased to have you with us today. Um, these idea exchanges are some of our favorite things to host. Um, I know that uh, we as a staff always learn so much from these idea exchanges. Um, the information that you share with each other is um, we then take out and share with um, other family treatment courts and, and um, other stakeholders that we meet with. Um, so I really, you know, I think we all feel that this is one of the most important um, kinds of things that we do um, in working with um, treatment court and other stakeholder groups associated with our family treatment courts. Um, so today we are going to talk about um, recovery capital. And I just want to remind, I see lots of faces on camera. Thank you so much. If you are willing and able, please um, turn on your camera. Please engage with us in the chat. And um, as we get this conversation going, you know, please speak up. Um, again, these meetings, this, this is only as um, effective um, as as all of you, you are what makes these peer-to-peer -peer idea exchanges um, really, really awesome. So thank you for being here. Um, can we, um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I think many of you probably have seen our mission at the Center for Children and Family Futures, which is um, to prevent strive to prevent child abuse and neglect while improving the safety, permanency, well-being, and recovery outcomes with equity for all children, parents, and families affected by trauma, substance use, and mental health disorders. And um, our goal is to support you in this work. Next, please. Um, I work specifically with the National Family Drug Court Training and Technical Assistance Program. Um, you will see lots of our um, FDC TTA staff on today's call um, joining us in this conversation. As always, we'll have that uh, contact at the end. If you are not part of our um, our emails, if you're not receiving our emails, we can add you to that listserv. And if other questions come up, um, please reach out to um, the FDC TTA program and we will um, do everything we can to get that answered and connect you to other resources. Next, please. Um, the Family Drug Court uh, Training and Technical Assistance Program is generously funded um, by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, who also um, fund and have been funding um, many of our local and state grantees um, working to develop and support family treatment courts. Um, as always, the opinions, findings, and conclusions um, and recommendations that we share today um, are those of the CCF staff and all of you and do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Justice. Next, please. All right, so we're gonna just kind of go through this um, welcome, do a little bit of a poll, um, have kind of a fun icebreaker and then really get into this um, recovery capital discussion, wrapping up with some resources. And again, that opportunity to um, sign up for our list serve and complete an evaluation survey. Uh, next, please. If you have not yet had an opportunity, many of you may have joined us earlier this month when we did our Practice Academy Beyond Compliance, empowering families to build recovery capital for sustained recovery and family wellness. 
Um, we have, there is a very short, um, from beginning to end, it's about 14 minute animated video that describes recovery capital, talks a little bit about how you can support it as a team. Um, and then also resources and exploration tool that help you, um, it's a team discussion and take action guide um, that you can use. These are really great um, resources to use in one of your team um, lunch and learns or other kinds of shared um, cross-disciplinary learning. Earlier this month, we hosted the live conversation with um, three professionals, a peer recovery support specialist, a treatment professional, and a um, state level um, sort of advocacy um, person. So we really recommend take a listen to that live conversation. Um, there's a great conversation and you'll get lots of great ideas about how to support recovery, support and, and grow recovery capital in your community. Um, next, please. Um, I am sure two years and four months in um, that you're pretty familiar with, with Zoom at this point. Um, but please do um, engage in that chat with us um, please talk with each other, ask each other questions, um, raise your hand and offer to, um, to speak or to ask that question out loud. Um, you know, really, again, turn on your camera if you are able. Um, next, please. All right, we're going to Let's go to our, before we go to the icebreaker, let's go ahead and Monica, if you would release our um, polling question. All right, so we asked kind of this question when you registered, but, um, it, and we also asked it during the live conversation, but how familiar are you with recovery capital? That term and what it, what it, uh, encompasses. Are you very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar at all? So let's take a few minutes and um, post. Um, and as we're getting going with that, um, let's talk a little bit about what recovery capital is. Um, Monica, do we, I'm, I can't see how many responses we have. You wanna post that up? Okay, so um, it looks like most of you are somewhat familiar, um, but about a third of you are not familiar at all. And just a small number, less than 10% of you are very familiar. So hopefully um, by the end of this hour, all of you will be able to say that you are very familiar with recovery capital. And um, I am going to hazard a guess that um, you actually are um, more familiar than you think, perhaps. So let's... Um, Let's go ahead and talk about that. So this is a slide that comes from our, um, our video, that short video um, that we talked about. And so personal recovery capital. Um, and as I'm talking, I'd love for you to start to, at, you know, start engaging in that chat. Um, share some of what personal recovery capital means to you. So personal recovery capital is sort of, it's composed of two kind of big buckets. The first one are physical resources. Um, I often think of these things as being um, those, those first layers of Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. So they're things like, you know, a safe and affordable home. Um, they're things like um, good health. They are things like having enough money to um, buy groceries and have good nutrition and live in a safe kind of neighborhood. Um, they are um, and having good transportation. So those are those kind of physical recovery capital things. 
Um, but we also have human capital um, that's also personal. And those things are a little bit more, uh, maybe they feel a little bit more amorphous, um, but I'd love to hear how you support personal recovery capital. So that's things like skills, um, problem solving skills, um, perseverance, um, having, um, you know, good education um, and, you know, feeling confident in your ability to read, write, communicate with others, um, feeling like you've got some um, sense of future and purpose. Um, some of those things when we're talking about those SAMHSA four domains of home and um, health and um, purpose. Um, so if you are, um, if you have some experience in supporting that personal recovery capital, particularly those human capital things of problem solving and um, sort of a sense of humor and perseverance, how are some of the ways that you um, support your participants the folks that you work with, how do you help them develop those skills? Um, how do you um, uh, demonstrate those skills as a professional working with folks or as a team? Um, the family social recovery capital, these are things that are um, much more related to, you know, rebuilding your family, um, having good parenting skills, having a good parent-child relationship, all of those kinds of things, having um, partners who support you in your recovery. And finally, we have community recovery capital. And those are things like, are there, are there um, role models in the community who um, kind of demonstrate what it is like to be in recovery? Um, do you have good AA, NA, other recovery, community recovery support? Um, can you go to a community event with your children and have that event be um, substance free, fun, um, all of those kinds of things. So I've been I've been talking a lot and I'm starting to see some of these um, some of your notes. And as we're looking at all of your notes. Um, and I really thank you for putting these in here. Let's go ahead and, um, and launch our icebreaker, if you would. And I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Jen Foley. Hi there, everybody. I'm so glad to be here with you. So if you're not familiar with what how to use a Mentimeter, if you wanna pull up on your phone or another browser screen on your computer and pop in the www.mentimeter.com, and once you get to that site, it will prompt you to ask you for a code. You're going to put in that 612-60086 code. And then it's going to give you the opportunity to add a word um, that will reflect what does the term recovery capital mean to you. And as folks start doing that, we're going to see magical words pop up on the screen. And the larger the word, that means the uh, larger number of folks have actually also entered that word. And um, as we see this grow and develop in front of us, it's gonna create what's known as a word cloud, which we love making and using this as an icebreaker. Um, and what Ariel will do afterwards is the actual screenshot of what our final word cloud looks like will um, be sent out to everybody for you all to share, to save if you want and keep. It looks like we've had 14 people and we have 97 folks on our, our meeting here. So I'm gonna allow people a little bit more time to, to really jump in and participate in our Mentimeter Word Cloud. I know sometimes we have glitches that take a little while to get onto sites. Um, and again, you can just do this from your phone too, if you don't want to, or you have some kind of a a uh, security system in your organization that doesn't allow you to access an outside site, please just feel free to use your phone. Great, we're up to 35 now. Looks like our big number one word is support so far. So great job. Um, and I don't know, why don't we wait and try and get ourselves up to 50 would be great if we can get 
half of us, close to half of our little more than half, that would be great to make a really big, all encompassing word cloud. We're almost there. So please take a minute and jump on in and go and add your word to the word cloud. We're almost there. I love seeing all of the chat. And so I'm going to invite you when we shift to this next um, phase, which is going to really be us having a discussion. Like Shirsten and I would prefer not to be the ones doing the talking. We're going to invite folks to jump on, uh, turn your cameras on, um, unmute, and uh, jump in. So looks like we're close. Um, Errol, do you want to call it now? Or you, well, yeah, okay. So here's our final word, cloud. And it looks like community support connection are the large words. So those were the ones that got the most hits to them. So great job. And she'll send this out with the follow-up resources to everybody. So nice job. Thank you so much. I think now we're going to stop sharing slides. And I get to see everybody. Hello. So good to see faces. Thank you so much. Um, it warms my heart two plus years in to see that we have a lot of folks that are willing to, to really be here with us. Because for me, even on in a virtual platform, I, I get to connect when I see faces. And so, um, you know, one of the reasons why I'm also uh, on here and co-facilitating is because I'm a person in long-term recovery myself. Um, I, uh, my sobriety date is February 3rd, 1991. I started my career out as a mentor, a peer mentor. And, um, you know, and I just, I share that because way back then, which was back in 95 when I started my career, um, recovery capital was not a thing, but it's not really new. We've all been doing, uh, we've been working with helping the families we, parents we work with, you know, increase their recovery capital. So I want you to think about what Shirsten just shared. If you watched the video, um, if you are on the live conversation, I want you to think about recovery capital. I want you to think about um, does your assessment process in your family treatment court, does it identify parent, child, and family strengths, protective factors, or our new word, recovery capital, um, resources uh, in addition to needs? And so when we look at and think about um, how we're assessing our families that we're working with, how are we as a FTC team? How am I as a peer support working amongst and part of a team or the caseworker or the judge? How are we assessing and looking at recovery capital? Please unmute and share and let's talk about this because really this is, um, our hope is that we're gonna just have a conversation that you're all leading and sharing with us. Is anybody brave enough? to be the first to unmute and share. Please, Molly, come on in. So hello, um, my name's Molly and I work for Weber Human Services. I've been doing uh, peer support with the family drug court for the last four years. Um, I also was a participant of the family drug court program myself in 2013, which I was successfully able to gain reunification. So I've been a person in long-term recovery and I, my sobriety date is September 27th of this year. I'll be uh, nine years in recovery. So um, <laughs> my experience working with the um, family drug court program, we actually are calling it family recovery court right now. Um, it's been awesome. You know, I've been able to um, work as both a certified peer support specialist as well as a case manager for Weber Human Services. So um, offering that support with resources as well. I know that when our participants join the program, um, they are you know, able to get our funding source access to recovery services funding. And um, in that first appointment with case management, they are able to um, do the recovery capital. So we're able to kind of see where they are rating themselves with, you know, living in that safe, you know, community, um, you know, if they have transportation, we're able to kind of utilize that recovery capital in that sense um, during that first appointment and then kind of meet the needs as we go through the program with the participants. Thank you so much, Molly. 
who else would like to come on in and share with us how you and your role or your team is really assessing your family strengths, protective factors, or maybe you're already using the word recovery capital. Anybody else? Can you all hear me? Yes. Is that um, I, Yes, I work for Hope. Um, which is a family treatment court out of Fulton County. But we do a recovery with um, capital assessment during our initial assessment. So it kind of helps us see what they may struggle with in our program. Um, and then it also allows us to kind of put services in place or create goals with them that will increase their recovery capital. That's great. So it's an actual uh, document, assessment document that you have and walk through with them. And and who is there? Is that your role on the team to do that or? Um, I do it sometimes, but it's our main clinician when she does the um, ASI and the other assessments that we do. Great. Then she does do a recovery capital. Awesome. Others want to share with us? And the other thing I would love to encourage you all to do is that if you're curious about the tool or the assessment form that Shantae is using, or you hear others share about documents or tools or ideas, reach out to each other. Um, this is your opportunity to network with each other, to exchange um, your emails and circle back with each other after to be able to, you know, we don't want to recreate the wheel. If there's already something out there, you know, we're always, you know, encouraging folks to share with each other um, what you're doing and tools you're using. Any others that would like to unmute? Ariel, I see you're unmuted. Um, so our family treatment court does not um like use recovery capital, but I do feel I um I'm the program coordinator for the Parents in Recovery program at the Kingdom Recovery Center. So I do peer recovery support and like one-on-one -on -one and then evidence-based groups like Seeking Safety um, and All Recovery. And so I work alongside with the Family Treatment Court team and I do feel that I'm very valued and that my opinion is very valued because um, we do like a recovery case management plan that goes over the different areas of their life and then like I seek out like which areas are most important, starting with like the basics, housing, food, those basics needs. And then we build up into like, okay, planner, organization, like stabilization, and then like visitations. And just eventually like also the, once you get your kids back, that reintegration part too, because sometimes that can, it's a struggle sometimes getting your kids back because you love them, but they're annoying sometimes. So <laughs> just having that support there for that process as well. Um, I've had a lot of participants, especially through COVID, through the Family Treatment Court, um, really stick by and utilize the service, which was nice. We're a very small community, so our numbers are not very big. I'm like the only person doing the program. Um, but just the fact that we were valued and we still had participants throughout COVID, I feel proud of. And I do feel that the clinician and that's on the team and the, um, I just lost the word. MHC provider, I do feel like they value my opinion when they're like, okay, where is this person at? Because they know just from my experience, sometimes I can tell where someone's at and their substance misuse by their behavior or their looks more than maybe just like a clinical assessment could tell where they're at in their use. Um, so I feel like that's kind of helpful and I'm thankful that it's recognized. Unfortunately, don't have any like official forms for the treatment court, but it would be really awesome to have one that I could utilize that would actually be structured to show like, this is what I'm doing. And then maybe be able to get, gather some data from that as well if I was able to capture what I'm doing instead of just knowing that is what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Definitely, thank you. Any others that would like to share about how you're assessing for recovery capital? If not, I'm gonna turn it over to Shearston because I see in the chat, um, a question that is really going to be, uh, we're going to shift over to talking about uh, staffing and court hearing. So I'm going to shift that to you, Sherston. I think you've also seen the question in the chat about that. Yeah, before we go, Ashley Armstrong, are you willing to share for a minute about how you all have been assessing for recovery capital at the phase change as we start to talk about this next piece? 
Sure. Um, so we recently redid our phase structure and our policies. And so um, we did include the recovery capital scale being completed in each phase with their peer recovery specialist that's assigned to them. Um, so it's kind of new. We kind of just started taking participants back in. Um, so our two lovely peers that are both on today um, will be doing with the participants each phase. So in order to move to the next phase, it has to be done within that phase. Um, and then right now we have a way we're saving them. We'd like to get some data on them and also share them with, we share them with the team. Um, but I'd just be curious to know different ways that we could tie that back into, you know, how do we talk about those at staffing and how do we, you know, present it to the participants and that, you know, so they see their progress as they move throughout the program. Thank you. Thanks for sharing about, and we'd love to hear, you know, follow up as you start to do that. Is anybody else doing that recovery capital assessment at each phase change? If you're doing that, would you drop that into the chat? Um, so, so let's talk about that. Like, how do you, how do you talk about um, recovery capital in staffing? How do you talk about um, recovery capital um, during those um, court reviews with folks. Um, Judge Owens, are you are you available? Can you jump on and talk a little bit about this? Um, sure. How you all do it? Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, you know, the term um, recovery capital is not something that I was uh, familiar with. Um, however, in looking at the assessment um, and looking at some material in advance of this uh, as to um, what that term meant, it's something that we've been doing all along, okay? I mean, we always talk up to our participants about what their, what their strengths are. Um, we do that from the jump when they first become involved in the program, and then what their particular needs are. And we do that at every phase um, move during the, the process. I think what this uh, information will provide us with is an opportunity to really put a name to those things that we were already doing. And I think enhance the way that we um, do that. I really appreciated uh, someone including um, the assessment, because I think that's something we're going to start using like tomorrow um, with our people, uh, because it really gets more in depth into the sort of um, resources, uh, both personal and community based that the folks have access to that can impact their ability to be successful, both uh, proximally and distally um, in the um, in their recovery. So um, so it, it's something, and I think maybe this is something that every uh, program maybe does, but it, we're just not doing it maybe in uh, the most ideal way we could do it, which is what these uh, sessions are all about, right? So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Judge. And um, Judge Owens is part of our peer learning court from um, group uh, from Wapolo. Um, Iowa. So thanks so much for being with us today. Um, Ashley, Christendon, um, you had your hand raised. And I think that was to talk about that. Like, how do you how do you figure this out? And how do you move folks? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm Ashley Christensen. I work with Iowa Children's Justice in Iowa. So shout out to Judge Owens and his peer um, learning court. Um, I did want to highlight the practice of our Buena Vista County Family Treatment Court in Storm Lake, Iowa. Um, we, um, timing was uh, poor-ish because we implemented this process right at COVID time and then we had some virtual challenges. But what we did, um, based off the work of William White, um, implemented a process of using the recovery capital um, scale to have the parent identify the specific areas of their life where they felt they had the most need. And then from that, with their peer recovery coach, they, they developed a plan. And that was kind of like their way of progressing through phases. We had, the team has some other kind of benchmark milestones that they um, work with the parents on achieving throughout that process. But it also then ties in that parent's opportunity to identify their own goals, set some short-term 
goals and then have a plan around that. And so once the plan is complete, um, it is, um, we in Iowa developed a case management system with um, kind of the, the support of a company called Xeris, where all of our team members have access to this confidential case management system. Our um, recovery capital plans are uploaded into that system. Um, the parent is then sent for or set for a roundtable. Uh, with their individual team members to review and discuss the recovery capital plan. Um, and then once the parent has, um, over the course of about three months, um, completed their goals or is in process of working towards those goals, then we set another uh, roundtable with that parent to determine um, where they're at, if they met the um, pro programmatic goals for phase advancement, um, and then once they have, then the parent with the peer recovery coach will um, complete another recovery capital scale to, um, again, assess where their needs are at in the different domains of wellness and then com complete another recovery capital plan based on those goals or those areas. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, Michelle Kimbrough, um, I don't know if you're can, willing to come on and join us. Michelle um, is also from one of our peer learning courts in Travis County, Texas. And Michelle, I wondered if you could talk about, um, you know, how, how do you know if somebody has these, you know, has these recovery capital assets? Like, how do you know that so that you can move people through the phases? How do you talk about that? Well, I think it's important for all of us on the team to be talking to um, participants about their recovery um, and, and, and focus on recovery um, and, and that this process is about recovery. I know that the, um, the judge will often ask participants, you know, how is your recovery going? How are your meetings going? Are you documenting your meetings? Um, and, and we don't specifically require that they do any type of recovery meetings. Of course, we don't mandate 12 step or anything like that, but we do require that they work a recovery program and that they are connected to a fellowship of recovery. Um, and that includes their peer recovery coaching. Everyone gets a peer recovery coach. The recovery coaches do the assessments for recovery capital, um, and they continue to work with them on that throughout the program. Um, we have a baseline where um, they do about 20 sessions with the peer recovery coach, but that could be more or less depending on their individual needs. And, you know, if there is a relapse or if there is a need for further um, recovery work for their treatment, they'll do an assessment with our co coordinator um, where um, she doesn't actually use a recovery capital scale, but this is a lot of the stuff. I was actually looking at the William White assessment, and that is a lot of stuff that she asked, you know, what, what happened? Who were you around when this relapse occurred? You know, what do you feel like you are um, needing to progress with your recovery. A lot of times uh, she'll uncover that they need um, some more uh, trauma specific treatment um, because they are in having flashbacks or anxiety or nightmares. Uh, sometimes the conclusion is people, places, and things. They don't need to be around certain people. And I, I realize that, you know, we we should be looking at it from a strengths perspective and we should be assessing that before the relapse. I mean, that is the ideal situation and making sure that all those supports are in place. Um, but even if there has been the other way around where you need to assess after the fact, um, that's when you know barriers can be assessed and those recovery supports can be put in place. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Isaiah Gardner, I think you had your hand raised. Yeah, thank you, it's Asia. Um, my question was actually for Ashley. So you were saying how you guys, you um, do a meeting, um, a round table meeting, like once they've completed the goals, do you do one at the beginning too? Like once you um, first do that scale and come up with a plan, do you start having a meeting there? Yep, um, okay. that's a really great question, question, Asia. Thank you for asking it. So yeah, we do, because we want to make sure that the team and the parent are on the same page. Okay. And what I forgot to mention was that, um, 
because this is a document in our case management system, we use this to facilitate the conversations that we have during staffing and then the judge's interaction with the parent during the court session. So we can we can talk about if transportation was a very barrier, big goal is to get the car, um, little goals are, you know, different steps along the way. And so like, where are we at in that process? What can the team do to assist you in achieving um, these little goals and milestones along the way? Thank you. Thank you. I don't have a plant for this, so I'm hoping somebody can help answer this question. Um, so I had a conversation recently with with um, some folks from a team, and and it was um, and child welfare was saying, you know, the team, the phases include some things that um, you know we don't necessarily look at when we're thinking about safety or return to the home. Um, for children. And, you know, the example they gave was, um, was some educational kinds of um, achievements that, that the phases and the team were trying to encourage. Um, how do you, it, it, how do you um, kind of figure out um, what things need to go into those phases that really are about recovery capital? And how do you balance that with you know, needing to get the children back in the home and needing to close that child welfare case, knowing that recovery is such a long process and really getting to that space of stable recovery. Yeah, that's a hard question. We'll see, I always have a plant. Judge Owen, you want to jump on there for me? Do you have a thought about this? Well, we're using the information that we get. Um, and again, we weren't really calling it recovery capital, but we're using the information that we get uh, on a parent's uh, strengths and their needs all throughout the process. Ashley talked about the staffing process that we go through and the round table process that we go through with families to try to assess what their strengths are, the sorts of things that we can use that they have in their life um, to build upon, uh, and then also assess what their needs are so that we can try to address those things. And we do those things in the round tables. And then I reinforce those things in the meetings that we have with uh, the parents when I'm talking with them face to face and try to have those folks um, share with me uh, the information that they shared with the team. We try to troubleshoot some of those needs so that we can build on what we're calling today recovery capital for them so that we can either maintain the kids in the house, which most of our parents uh, have their kids with them, or um, try to get those kids back in the home. And of course, we always have one eye. Um, on their sobriety and on their uh, recovery uh, and on uh, our guidelines that we have to meet under ASFA to make sure that we putting those kids back in the home within the time frame that's allowed for us um, uh, by a state and federal law. So um, it is a balancing act, but it's one that, um, you know, our team is, I think, particularly adept at um, using the information that we're able to garner from the parents and then trying to build upon their strengths and address their needs uh, in ways that the team can uh, assist the parent with in uh, using the community-based services to try to build on those strengths that they have. Thanks, Judge, and thanks for jumping on with that. I wanna pass this back um, to Jen. To kind of talk you, about yeah before you do we have a hand raise michelle you want to jump in on this yeah i was just saying it, um i think it's important to weave um as you were talking about weaving that into your face criteria you know we do actually have in our face criteria that they establish a home group um that they um do service work and we actually give uh for phases three and four we give them a list of uh, different service work activities. And that could be just making coffee for their meeting. That could be being a, a door greeter. That could be um, 
taking one of their peers from treatment who just got out of treatment and come into a sober house, taking them to a meeting, you know, but we have them actually as part of their requests for the next phase, write about that experience and what it was like for them and how it was to be a leader. And that helps them to understand the importance of giving back. Uh, we also, through the SAMHSA grant we just got, it was, it's been fabulous. We have been able to actually use that funding to train people to be peer recovery coaches. And if they're interested to send them through um, the Recovery Coaching Institute. Um, and we've gotten a lot of interest in that. Um, and people have really begun to understand what it's like to give back. Great. I see we have a couple hands. Um, Asia, I saw you your hand up first. Yes, thank you. So I don't know if this is a question for Jennifer, Kristen, or anybody who was actually using the scale, but how do the scale, I know Judge Owens kind of talked about it, but how do the scales differ from case plans that focuses on strengths? I'm going to invite somebody from our audience who is actually using the scales to jump in and answer that. So please. Uh, and Leslie, I see your hand too, so I will get you, but if you have something you want to jump in about this, please unmute. Who out there uh, wants to talk about how you're using the scales and how they differ from case plans? And again, I guess I mean differ from case plans that are already focused on like strengths and support. I just kind of want to know what you all think the difference is. Or maybe are there not, is it the same thing? It's just different right. language right. is what I would, I'm not doing field work now, so I don't know, but that's where I would come from. And Leslie, feel free if you want to jump in uh, and, and address this and then talk about what your hands up, please feel free to. Oh, well, I don't have anything to offer for that question from Asia right now, but <laughs> I okay. just wanted to talk about the, the, uh, structuring of phases and things like that. So I can Perfect. wait till, till this okay. question is over. Thank you. Yes, I will circle back. Um, any of our peers or do we have any caseworkers or coordinators that wanna talk about um, how you either see or don't see there being a difference between uh, case the scales and strengths that we talked about within traditional case plans we've been using for all along? I'll jump in here just, um, we're a new court. I don't have any participants yet, but I have worked at child welfare and done wraparound um, coordination and things like that. And I think um, to Asia's question that, that they're probably just very similar um, as you would see in some other case plans. It's just, we're, we're looking at it a little bit differently, a little bit of a different lens through it and tying some of these skills to, to the human, you know, to the person. Um, and there are different sets of strengths. And the other thing I really like about the recovery capital piece is the community piece and um, helping to build a community that really supports recovery. I don't think we see that enough of that in um, other plans, other case plans. They don't talk about you know, the community um, as a whole. Uh, and so I think with FTCs, it's really important too that we're looking at services we should be adding and things like that that are things we're learning through these recovery capital um, assessments and just through our work with, with folks in recovery. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, I don't see anybody else raising hands or unmuting about this particular question. So I am gonna shift to Leslie and just to also note that Leslie's from Grant County um, and their family recovery court is, they're also one of our PLCs. So Leslie, take it away. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, actually, um, I am a CASA director, so um, while I'm not the coordinator, I have had the pleasure of being part of our Family Recovery Court team from the time of even investigating the opportunity to have one up until now. So I've been involved with this since 2013. Um, it's, we have been in operation with our Family Recovery Court since 2015. So we were really noticing over the last several years kind of you know, the ships passing in the night kind of thing. We were just not quite hitting where we wanted to hit with a lot of our participants. So we've been in the process of developing a new phase structure for the last couple of years, probably three years, if I'm honest with you. Um, with COVID, you know, things kind of halted some of our, our planning. And 
one of the things that we have decided is really important is to identify that sense of hope within our participants. So we have even changed our structure of phases from a three phase system to a five phase system. And we're not even, we're gonna try not to call them phases, but we're calling them by what they are. Oh, Pardon me? Oh, finding hope, pursuing hope, um, embracing hope, experiencing hope and living hope. So we're trying to A, just incorporate this idea into the structure itself and really putting in every single one of these hope um, stages at the recovery capital built in. Um, I will be very interested to see, thinking of the question um, that was posed a few minutes ago about how this will affect long-term recovery. We are really seeing a lot of repeat offenders, <laughs> repeat customers, so to speak. And It'll be very interesting to see if this new phase system and this idea of building this in more um, intentionally will kind of curb that um, because we're, we're really just still seeing that we're kind of missing the point for them. It's not just checking the boxes. It's not just completing this program to get out of it and move on with your life. We really want to affect the long-term change in family systems. So. That's what we've been working toward and getting ready, hopefully in the next few months to uh, put this into action. Thank you for sharing, Leslie. It's great to hear. And I love the way you're shifting and looking at hope and, um, you know, and the work that you've been doing and that you have persevered through the most challenging time I think anybody, any of us have ever lived through in every aspect of our personal and professional life. So my hat's off to you that you have continued to persevere. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to, in our last few minutes, bring up um, a recovery consideration. And it's not something that I, I don't know, maybe it is talked about more and I've just been missing it, but it's something for us to think about. Um, way back when, when I was a peer, um, one of the things that we brought into the organization I worked with was social skill events. Um, something that's really challenging as a person in recovery to learn how to do is to have fun and socialize. Um, and you know, there's a lot of anxiety. I'm sure. How do I do that? Um, it's nothing I've, I've never, you know, I can't say that I've ever learned how to socialize and have fun without putting substances in my body. Um, and so it's something for us to think about. I'm just curious out there where, where and when are you helping uh, your families you work with have like family friendly social recreational activities? Um, are they available in your community? Are you hosting them uh, as an FTC? Are you identifying and looking at, do they even exist in our community? Is it something you're even thinking about or talking about or implementing in your communities and the work you're doing? Uh, Judge Owens, please. <clears throat> well, thanks. Um, we may not do everything exactly right, but we do like to party. Um, and so we do have a lot of social activities for our participants uh, to engage in. Um, we have events throughout the year that are scheduled that we ask our parents and their families to participate in. Um, a number of members of our team are actually uh, going to be attending the NADCP meeting in Nashville uh, in uh, July at the end of the month. And it actually um, uh, goes over the uh, a day that we would typically have treatment court. And so um, uh, what we're planning for that particular day is that we are uh, going to fund um, all of our participants and their families to be able to go to the local water park um, so that they can have a day at the water park um, and they can socialize and make, um, you know, sober connections with one another. I mean, I think what you talk about, it's extremely important for these people to uh, that we work with to be able to find activities that they can do in the community with one another, but also to get them out in the community so that the people in the community that aren't involved in um, you know, the so-called sober community can see that these people have value um, and that they have things that they can 
um, share and bring to uh, the community at large. And it also shows them that they have that ability to be able to do that. And so that's just one thing that we're doing um, uh, just real recently. And we just put that together over the last couple of days because uh, we realized that our family treatment court day was going to um, be taken up by a number of us going to Nashville. So I, I just think if you're able to do that, if you're able to fund it, um, those events are just super important for your uh, participants, uh, for the parents and their families to be able to engage in. You know, a lot of times your parents, you know, they don't have custody of their kids. So that also gives them one more opportunity for an interaction with their with their kids. Um, and it also gives, you know, the people who are uh, sometimes looking over their shoulder um, while they're doing those interactions, a chance to also show them, uh, show the parents that, you know, they're actually people too, not just workers, you know, and so they are able to build a bit of a rapport uh, for that, with that, uh, with that parent. And I think that we're all better off for that. So I would really encourage that if, if you're able to fund it, uh, we do it a lot, and uh, we uh, seem to uh, our our folks really seem to enjoy it. Fantastic, great example, Megan. I see that you have your hand up. You want to share about this as well? Hey, all. Um, so I'm Megan Fitzgerald. I'm the training coordinator for Washington State Family Treatment Courts, um, and we have a couple of different ways that our courts sort of instill these um, sort of more casual connection building between um, uh, different members of family treatment courts. One of them, well, for both of them, as their docket got a little bit more full, um, and particularly for folks that are in later phases, they often can't meet every week for court. They don't have the ability to see as many families as they want to. So what they've put into place is an every other week court plan, where on the off weeks, the families still, or the, the um, the participants still come and meet up. And then in Mason County, and I think I saw Gabby Craner in here. Um, she helps lead some of those. They have a um, like a series of, of uh, life skills classes where they learn about financial planning, they learn about cooking, they learn about you know family friendly activities that are helped by university supports that come in and teach those classes. And then um, in one of our other courts, they just meet up and just socialize and just sort of they call it a check in, um, and they just say like, hey, everybody has to come in and just be a part of the court. At, in some way say hi to each other. And most of them really like just coming for an hour and chatting with other people that are in family treatment court as well and have similar experiences. And that leads to them building these sort of family connections where they can come together, um, bring their kids together, learn about how to do the process, um, meet people who are further along in the program and the newbies and sort of help train each other in a peer way that I think really works very well, um, particularly when it's that every week, it's always on the schedule. They know they have to be there regardless. Um, and that gives them the support that they need and that sort of accountability as well. So they're keeping with their, their um, program and planning. Thank you so much, Megan. And Laura, I see your hand up. And I think we'll wind down with, with hands at that point. But Laura, please share with us. Sure. Um, I just wanted to give some examples of some of the things that we've done with our participants. And they're really led by our coordinator and our recovery coach. Um, and we try and tap into things that are free in the community uh, to try and save on our budget. So we, um, like some of the things they went to recently were like associated with one of the local festivals in town. They went to like the free kids fishing derby. Um, they, we've also had like a, we did a friends giving over Thanksgiving where everyone brought a dish to pass and had a, a time to socialize together at one of the churches that donated space. Um, one of our judges was Santa for Christmas and we had a Christmas party. Um, and then, and then we've also had some like volunteer activities that we've taken participants to, to like the feed my starving children pack event, um, and doing some roadside cleanup with the other adult drug courts. We were going to do that, but we got rained out and we do plan on like participating in a build day for, a um, beds for kids program. Um, so I guess I just wanted to share to make sure that like if you, there's lots of free things you can tap into as well, because I think some, at least our participants sometimes just weren't comfortable going, 
um, without kind of a group or that support. We went to like the Main Street Trick or Treat as a big group, that was fun. Um, and then that we take pictures and then the judges show those pictures during court to kind of encourage people to participate that maybe were reluctant or hadn't uh, attended before. So that's all. Thank you, Laura. So important to share um, things that are free as well. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating. I'm going to turn this over to Sherston to help wrap us up. My, my unmute button kept moving. Um, thank you so much. Again, I just love these events. I love learning from all of you and um, all of the connections. This is just such a, a fabulous group of folks. Um, so a couple of resources that we want to share with you. Um, next, um, please do, uh, we're gonna drop the, um, evaluation link into the chat. It's really important for us to hear from you what worked, what didn't work, what do you want us to work on next, um, talk about next. And, and um, we're always trying to, um, you know, kind of up our game to, to better serve your needs. So please do complete that evaluation next. Um, we have one more Practice Academy this year. Um, you'll see there in April, we focused on um, collaborative partnerships. Um, in June, we talked about recovery capital. And in August, we are going to talk about data, um, actually how you can learn to love working with data. So please, um, we'll drop that, uh, the um, registration for that in the link and please plan to join us. As usual, there'll be a video and resources and then a live conversation. Next. Um, there's that link again to the um, Practice Academy that's attached to or focused on recovery capital. Again, this is a great opportunity for you to, um, if all of your team couldn't join today, we really recommend that you um, have this conversation with your team. Such a great opportunity to figure out how can we be more intentional, as many of you said. Make sure that everybody understands that all this work you've been doing um, has really been about recovery capital, even if we haven't been talking about it. It's a great way to bring the team together um, and share that language and share your approach with families. Next. Um, really nice uh, resources here, faces and voices of recovery. We're always so thrilled to have so many peer recovery support specialists with us on these peer-to-peer um, -peer learning exchanges and really appreciate all that you share and all that you bring to these, but also the work that you do um, with families and uh, supporting the team and in the community. So um, great resources here. Next. Um, again, we've been dropping these into the chat um, as we've been going through, but these, uh, these slides will be available to you. So if you missed it during the chat, um, please go ahead and you can find um, lots of folks talked about William White. So there's those papers and some of those resources. Next. Talked about peer uh, learning court program. There you go. Those are where all of our peer learning courts are across the country. Thanks to those um, team members who came on and shared today. If you'd like to be connected to a PLC, please reach out to us, put it in the chat, um, send us an email and we will go ahead and connect you. Next. Uh, best practice standards, if you haven't downloaded them, go ahead and do it, next. And these briefs, I think, are really nice. Uh, they are, in fact, brief, and they're a great way to um, talk with your stakeholders. This, If you are thinking about expanding some of your community recovery capital um, resources, these briefs might be a great way to start the conversation with some of those 
um, community partners who maybe are less familiar with the work that you do in your family recovery court or family treatment court, um, this can really um, help you uh, have that conversation. And next. And finally, there we go. If you are not on our listserv, um, we will happily sign you up, send us an email, um, visit our website. Um, we are here to um, help connect all of you and answer those questions and get other resources to you. Um, thanks very much. All right. Um, if you need to and want to, uh, you can click, right click or click on the um, three little buttons in the chat and that will save the chat. Thanks for joining us.